want to start by welcome everyone here. Welcome to this session we'll have together. Uh, first, I want to direct a big thank you to ISPIN. It's great to be here and for you inviting us to this important discussion to focus on the cornerstone of what we as researcher can understand and contribute with to the innovation management field the method and to really have the opportunity to dig a little bit deeper into how we perform the research and, and new values of data and, and ways of uh, analyzing data. My name is Jenny Birk. I am an associate professor at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and I'm also the editor in chief for creativity and innovation management journal for the last six years, together with Katarina Hunsel and Harry Boer. And I'm delighted uh, to present the persons in focus here today, Tim and Christina. Uh, Tim uh, Swinefurt is an associate professor uh, in high tech business at the University of Twente. You spend a lot of your time focused on data and technology driven innovation and also at the early phase focus on ID generation and evaluation system and also a lot about where we are venuing in today here as well when it comes to distributed and uh, collaborative innovation. So uh, much welcome team and also have done a lot of research together with a lot of firms here. Hi team. Good to have you with us. And then we have Christina Rash. You're an associate professor of digital economy at the Kuhne Logistics University, uh, but you're also connected to the Kiel University of the World Economy. And you have focused extensively on how digitalization changes innovation processes and the outcomes, both inside and outside the firm, which we also will dwell deeper into here today. Most welcome, Christina. <laughs> So we will have a discussion here today about a very interesting paper that two of you published in SIM last year. You actually received the Tudor Richer and Susan Moger's SIM Best Paper Award last year. So congratulations to that. And um, uh, we will dwell today into your contribution here and especially with a method focus. Uh, and um, for you who are participating here, you're most welcome to write questions in the chat. This will be a kind of um, discussion going on between me, Tim and Christina, and you're most welcome to join. So just point your question in the chat and we will bring them forward. And we, of course, also will have time then for some more questions if you prefer to do it that way. So the paper which we will base the discussion on here today is called Court Between the Users and the Firm. How does identity conflict affect uh, employees' innovative behavior? So Tim and Christina, would you mind bringing us up to speed for the ones that have not read the paper yet? What is it about? Yeah, thanks Jenny. And also thanks for Ispam and Sim uh, for inviting us. Yeah, so the paper is on internal or embedded lead users, how we call it. And um, Christina and I have been doing research on user innovation. So on the notion that not only firms, but also users innovate. And we have been especially focusing on internal users. So you are working for a firm, but you're also using the, the firm's products. So you're a skateboarder in a skateboarding firm or a gamer in a gaming firm. And we found that there's lots of benefits for employing these internal users. So creativity and they bring in use knowledge and they also reach out to external communities. But we also realized that in interviews that these people were not always really 100% happy in those firms. And this was opposed to what we thought, right? So they kind of make their, their passion, their profession, so they should be really happy. And um, But instead, they were somehow often torn between what the firm wanted and what they wanted for themselves, what they wanted for the community. And this is actually what we're investigating in this paper. So we wanted to know how the job satisfaction and innovative behavior of these users actually relates to the conflict that they perceive between the firm and the user community that, that they're in. And we, we expected that um, job satisfaction innovation is especially harmed if um, those employees identify with the firm and the users and there's some kind of conflict between these two identifications. And um, the same expectation is also what we we had the same expectation for impact on innovative behavior. So that's basically the, the gist of the paper. Thank you very much, Tim. We, we thought it was a highly relevant paper to focus upon in this set, session through both the theoretical and practical relevance, which you motivated here, but also the way in, through, in terms you collected data in new ways. 
And, and what we as editors especially liked with this paper is that we know that so many organizations struggle today. It's a constant discussion that how we can reap these benefits from outside, um, both in terms of knowledge and information, but also when it comes to persons and how they relate to this setting. And they get more knowledge, information and insights and ideas on this and how that affects innovations, uh, organizations, innovation outcomes is an area that is of constant importance for uh, the innovation management field and especially for journals such as CIM. Um, but given all of this focus at the end of the day, it is what you bring up here. We're talking about the individuals here, um, employees. Uh, there are people at the end of those nice reasoning and argumentations here and that are likely to identify in different ways as you bring up here as well. So from our perspective, this is both theoretically and practically a very relevant, relevant piece. Uh, and how you go about this when we talk about methods here is very interesting because you have your motivation and your ideas that we need to be able to explore how these individuals are affected through being both inside and outside the organization, how that affects the job satisfaction and in turn then innovativeness as you do here. And you talk about this dual identity that actually can both belong to the focal firm and, and outside here. Um, so when you have such a question and such a research motivation, then we end up in this situation where we don't always talk that much about them, that the, the closeness to empirics sometimes also sets the frame of what we are doing. And that's why I thought your paper was especially interesting to discuss in this setting, because you, you came with this motivation and then you went out finding these individuals in, 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 in a rather new way here. And you started by looking at, um, at what kind of industries that would be relevant to get this information on, on um, uh, that had this kind of position. And you had two criteria here. Would you mind starting here? How come you selected the industries you did here? Um, yeah, so maybe I can uh, um, uh, talk about this a little bit. So um, as you explained, uh, uh, Yenny, we were looking for people who experienced these dual identities, mm -hmm. uh, um, identify, uh, identifying with the firm, but also with the customers outside. So we um, thought it would be good to go for industries where uh, many employees are what Tim called embedded users. So they are using the products that their firm produces. They are, they, are, they are user and they are part of the producing company because thus they would um, have personal use experience, they would probably have relationships with other users um, and they would uh, be more likely to feel allegiance to, to other users. Um, so if you think about this, uh, I think this is a huge uh, phenomenon because um, you know, a lot of um, car drivers, if you like, work for BMW, right? And a lot of uh, cereal eaters who work for uh, Nestle uh, and a lot of uh, fashion connoisseurs uh, like to work for fashion companies and so on. Um, so it's a big phenomenon. Um, but uh, our second uh, criterion was um, that we were um, um, looking for industries where the use of the product is a joint activity. Um, so it's not just you know, everybody eating their cereal uh, quietly by themselves, but, but uh, if people relate to other users, they know other users, they uh, undertake joint use activities that would, uh, more like, uh, would be more likely to increase the identification and the, the allegiance they feel to these other users. So those were our two um, criteria, uh, industries with uh, embedded uh, users and with uh, joint use activities. And based on this, um, we chose uh, the mountain biking industry and online gaming because both of these yeah, satisfy the two criteria I just uh, laid out. Thank you very much. When you found these two industries that you want to go further into, did you have experience within those fields before or was, were these new to you? Um, there, there is prior research on um, those industries um, giving support to what I just said um, yeah. in terms of uh, usage patterns and so on. Some of this is uh, uh, our own work, some of this is other uh, work of, of other colleagues. Mm -hmm. And then you decided to use a professional network to access your data here or to, to find your empirics, rather say. Uh, and you used a network that called Sing, uh, similar to LinkedIn. 
Can you tell us a little bit about that? How did you do this? Mm, yes, so first, um, so we were looking at uh, pretty specific types of people, right? We were trying to find these internal lead users or embedded lead users. Um, and um, we know that this data is somehow hard to get. And at the same time, we were also trying to find um, some, some sensitive data in the sense, right? People would be talking about how they feel and how they feel in relationship to the firm and job satisfaction and so on. So when thinking about it, we realized that maybe it's not the perfect way to just attract a single firm and do a very big study within the firm. And also we didn't find a firm which, which wanted to do this. So we thought, well, maybe it's a, it's a nice way to just do it externally, right? So we saw these, um, these social networks, professional uh, social networks popping up and more and more people were coming on those platforms, especially um, on, on, in Germany and, and at the time. And uh, we realized that maybe this could be a, a chance to, to, to sample people, to find people and to ask them about these sensitive issues. And um, they also sign up with, with their name and their role and occupation, but also the, the, the firm that they belong to, right? So at the time, and I think it's still the, this way, firms also had sites where you could um, select yourself into as a user. So we knew, well, they are part of this firm and they are doing this and that job. And um, yeah, this this way we decided that we would actually try this and just um, just contact people via via this um, the social network. And um, what we did, and I think it's the same on on most social network. There's some kind of cap of of how much you can spam people, right? So there's some kind of cap of how much you can uh, uh, approach people. And this is why we uh, got a professional account, like a recruiter account. And this allowed us then to, to sample, identify people within firms, identify firms first, and then, yeah, um, send our survey to these people and also interact with these people. And um, was, uh, yeah, the dealers, not only the data, but also interactions, right? They also would write us back. And some of them, some of these contacts then still led into interviews afterwards. And so, so this was, um, yeah, somehow in, a nice way to collect data at that time for us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because it seems that such an, um, um, a promising venue to, to access this material, we have had some studies before looking at different types of social net, professional social networks. Uh, but the problem is, of course, always that how, how we can use the data, how we can validate the data, uh, and how we actually can get the responses that we want here. We can discuss response rates uh, forever uh, when it comes to different studies and different types of settings here. You have 15% in this one. Um, and I suggest that we directly move into that when you access this data, when you found these individuals that you are interested in these industries and you moved further into assessing the, the validity of this uh, data that you accessed here, uh, you do a lot of uh, careful and, and well thought routines here to secure that the kind of data that you get is, is in a good way. And I would just like to say in this, that, you know, generally speaking, it's of course, as a researcher, it seems like a very nice area to reach empirics easily, but to secure that the data you get actually uh, can help you answer those research questions you have, it's not that easy. It's quite a lot of work uh, reading your paper on this as well. So when it comes to especially bias treatment here, you do a lot of careful steps in this paper, which I truly appreciate. And I think that can also help many that are moving into this stream of research, trying to reach empirics in this way. So would you like to develop a little bit on this? You talk about non-response bias, for example. Um, how do you treat that? Um, yeah, so we, we looked at three types of biases in the paper. Maybe I can start with the non-response uh, yeah. uh, bias. So there, um, I guess we, we employed the standard uh, procedure um, um, whereby, you know, the assumption is that the non-respondents, for whom obviously you don't have answers, uh, are more similar to uh, the late respondents than to the early respondents. So you divide your sample into the early respondents and late respondents and see, uh, check whether there are any um, significant differences between uh, those two um, uh, groups uh, when it comes to the, the, the main variables of the, the study. So that's, that's what we did there. Um, it's a standard procedure and, and yeah, there were no significant differences. 
fortunately for us. Mm. Yeah, 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 it's good, good for you in this way. But then we went on looking a little bit more sampling bias. What is that? What What is a sampling bias? And how did you treat it? So actually what we wanted to show uh, is that the that the sample we have is not significantly different from the population we were that we wanted to infer to, right? So we wanted to see whether there's some kind of systematic difference in the sample we're actually collecting, um, which is usually tough to do, but we were um, lucky on that one in the sense that after approaching these firms, one of the firms said, uh, well, we're also going to um, send out the survey internally. We like this idea. So we had for this one firm also additional data that was not collected via the social network, but collected internally, and we would we would know which data was which data. So first, what we try to to find out is whether those internal employees who responded via email were somehow different than those who responded on the social network, right? To see whether there's some kind of systematic difference here, and then we just do very simple t tests to see whether there's some significant differences, and we don't find any. So that was was good news, and then what we did in addition on uh, on on firm level, so to say, check whether the individuals of of that firm who who also sent out the survey, whether those individuals answered differently than those individuals that we got from the from the network itself to see whether there's any significant um, differences, and also we don't uh, find these differences. So then we were at least uh, to some extent sure that um, that the that the sample we collected also reflected the overall population that we wanted to to look into basically yeah would that be something if, if you would do this kind of study again do you think there was something in how you selected these firms that made this um, assessment easier for you um, or um, would this be easy to do on any firm yeah because it sounds very easy when you talk about it but i know there's a lot of work behind it where you, where you need to access all of these different data points um, yeah, it's a little tricky because we wanted to have specific uh, specific individuals in the in this uh, sample, but at the same time, so that means we had to find specific types of yeah. individuals and firms. Mm -hmm. But at the same mm -hmm. time, we wanted to know whether these specific people we find are actually uh, very different from the from the overall uh, population. Mm -hmm. So I think there's in general already some kind of bias um, mm -hmm. in in those people who are on on such platforms. But I think this is becoming less and less the case because I think nowadays. But I, this may, of course, also be academia mm -hmm. bias, right? Almost everyone is on, on LinkedIn or, or Xing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it might be a little different for, for other industries, but I, I, I think that the, that, the, that the overlap between those on, on the platforms and those actually working, uh, the, the population of, of the general employees, so to say, that they become more overlapped um, uh, than the less overlap. At least yeah. this would be my my hypothesis, so to say. Yeah. Uh, one could do an assumption as well that maybe those are the same persons that would answer a survey, even if we send it through the regular ways to the company. To the say. We, there is, there is, uh, we always have to be a little bit careful about this as well, how we interpret it. But at the end of the day, we need the data as well. And then we need to Definitely. do as good as we can to, to, um, to assess the potential biases. And then you go through common method bias as well. Yeah, which, yeah. Which then we also go to regular. a common yeah. method bias mm -hmm. in that sense that's not 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 specific to the, the the data collection on the network, and here we're just trying to um, kind of use all the standard tests um, and also mm -hmm. survey designs to to overcome method uh, overcome common method bias. So comes the, the bias that is rooted in the fact that we only ask one individual here, and we do lots of tests, um, marker variable tests, and then we create an unobserved latent um, factor. Um, these are also rather well described. Um, in the end, I think, but one also has to be open and, and to admit that you can do all the tests, um, but if we would do this again, I think one thing that we would try to do is some kind of second, second source to make it, um, yeah, to make the study more solid. At the same time, it's hard to have a, a second source judge how happy you are at work and stuff like this, right? So I think for the innovative behavior, one could try that for for judging how how you identify with the firm or how happy you are. I think we just need self ratings there, yeah. and there we think our method is actually good because we come from external, right? And we don't we're not part of the firm. No, no. <laughs> and maybe, have you have you? Oh, sorry, Christina, sorry. Uh, to, to add to this just a little bit, I mean, 
um, um, the uh, you know that um, um, higher level interactions are more difficult to detect in the presence of, of common method bias. So in that sense, our our um, findings are solid in the sense that uh, uh, we do find uh, find a three way interaction, and it, that would be very unlikely to. Uh, uh, materialize uh, uh, in uh, if there were um, uh, this uh, problem. Um, so in that sense, I think sometimes it's like a um, uh, um, yeah sort of uh, uh, standard reviewer point, right? You, you know, couldn't there be common method bias? But sometimes it's um, actually not so much of a problem in the sense that uh, uh, it can even. Um, um, go our way in the sense that uh, yeah. you know we do we do find um, the three-way interaction here. Um, I have uh, a different paper where our point was that the absence of um, a relationship um, and uh, if common method bias inflates relationships, then it's particularly interesting that even though there could be this bias, we actually do not find a relationship. So I think it's a, mm -hmm. it's a you need to think about what what is really going on and how that yeah allows you to interpret your findings yeah. a lot so really, in, and really what you're after here as you say exactly yeah, yeah. so yeah. and in this case i think the, the finding is is yeah. solid in this regard i completely agree uh, we have a question here from the chat please feel free to to write uh, other one here as well if you have questions to team uh, christina and me here um we have a question here do the do uh, the authors think that if they have selected a different set of industry they would have incurred different methodological issues and would the result have been the same so if you would have gone for other industries here what do you think Would you have had the same uh, uh, routines and um, methodological issues and concerns? And do you think the results would have turned out in the same way here if you had other industries? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. I, 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 th I, th I think it might be might have been would have been harder to observe the phenomenon. But I think that's not what you're asking, right? You're more asking about the the approach. I would think that the approach would be could be transferred to other industries as well, right? I mean, it's always going to be easier to collect data this way if there's probably some kind of technology savvy mm -hmm. industry or um, IT savvy industry where lots of people are are used to using social networks. But then I think it can be transferred. Um, that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. I think good. I think your first question, uh, your first comment here is also interesting when it comes to how. Um, and that that it might have been harder to find it because it's it's easier for us to relate to this kind of the user that can identify both with the firm and with with the outside stakeholder when it's something that they can continue doing as one of your criteria was here that you can still work for in the mountain bike industry and, and spend a lot of time being a really advanced user here as well um, but that, of course, would be maybe even more interesting to explore in a setting when that, that is tough now and we know how it works uh, in the more things that we can use as individual easy. If we go into a completely different setting of um, maybe a more complex um, business to business offering, for example. <laughs> yeah, I would assume that would be venues for future research as well to continue this line of research and to see how this actually works in different industries and maybe also challenge some of those criteria because I agree with you that those criteria are very uh, well thought through in order to grasp it that is pretty hard to grasp empirically when it comes to how individuals um, relate to these different things but to continue in that line would be very very interesting as well. Um, so when, when it comes to your contributions here, I mean, I, I'm going to point the Monday morning question here. Let's say I'm from industry. Um, I'm running one of those mountain bike uh, companies. So what should I do differently uh, compared to what I've been doing based on your results here? Um, yeah, I think there are a couple of points here that are interesting. Uh, one is I think there's a huge potential for uh, practitioners to leverage their employees outside identities if they are aware of them so uh, first question what what should you do differently the question is how aware are you of um of these outside identities um and then um how can you use them to the benefit of the company because 
if you put employees in positions where um, their expectations from the company clash very much with the expectations that come from the outside and they identify with both, um, then this will be a very difficult position for this employee and it will lead to lower job satisfaction and so on, we know. So um, uh, what you could do would be to find these, um, <clears throat> these, these um, job um, profiles and put people in them uh, where um, there is a high um, alignment between the expectations from outside and inside. And then those employees could really thrive and be even more motivated and, and knowledgeable and um, boundary spanning and, and doing wonderful uh, creative work um, that would benefit the firm um, and, and the user community that they feel uh, bound to. So that would be one uh, thing. I think that is a really uh, intriguing area. And what, what to say first to just be aware, how aware are firms generally speaking about this? How aware is our academia of this? Yeah, they're pretty aware of meant going back to our business that when, when you get employed, that professors are also evaluated based on their social network within both industry and academia, I would say. Um, but we tend to not talk about it in this way when it comes to industry always. And to just know of all of the competence within a firm is one thing, but then to also acknowledge and be aware of what happens when the individuals uh, outside that, that is very interesting as well. and then um, the question is can you um, make room for this this need for alignment of these different identities that employees then have right so awareness is one thing but um, it may require adjustment uh, on the part of the company also to bring out the full potential of this uh, dual allegiance um, that the, the employees have Definitely, um, um, and um, first they probably need a tool to actually assess this in, the, in their organization. So there, there comes a, a very low hanging fruit to you back here. Will you continue doing this? Will you develop some kind of tool that uh, companies can use to assess this within their own organization? I think that could be very valuable. Because I think you're both the way you selected your peers and the way that you um, uh, did your survey here gives you some uh, really nice insights in how such a tool could be uh, developed and designed. Yeah, actually, we haven't thought about that yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's um, I, I think to understand these these user driven identities. Um, uh, it, um, an open open perspective towards what the employees want and need is also um, already a good good method right I don't know whether mm -hmm. we could develop a tool but if, if you if you realize that these people are constantly having ideas that they bring in from their leisure and that they want implemented and you constantly reject the, those ideas I think that's uh, probably the, not a, not a good way to go about it but rather try to empathize with these uh, with, with the individuals who bring in the ideas and try to yeah, reap some of the, the, the potential, the creative potential that is potentially get leveraged there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going back a bit to how we're organized as well, yeah. I would say there's, there's uh, even one step before all of this, uh, which is to, to be aware that you have users inside your company, right? Because most mm -hmm. firms tend to think of users as being out there in the market. So we inside the firm decide what those users out there are going to get to buy and, and do with our product and so on. But, but to realize that um, you have a lot of users inside your own uh, firm and uh, they, they have various advantages. They know a lot about the product, but they also know uh, about the firm's competencies and strategy and so on. And to, to see that as a, um, potential as a as a pool of, of knowledge and and uh, creativity. I think that's um, that's the starting point for um, the things that we just discussed already. Yeah, yeah. I fully agree. Uh, maybe just briefly related to that. And uh, I mean, we 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 saw that, and but we also saw sometimes that that these individuals also overestimated themselves, right? So at the same time, um, you would then have to check back and see whether these ideas are also reflected in what what other users want that these internal users might be too advanced or so so um i, I think realizing and, and leveraging the potential and at the same time also um yeah being um 
on the on the caution note when it comes to directly i'll i'll have, implement everything that this yeah. person says right so this should also be the key yeah so yeah. one internal lead user doesn't replace market research right uh, <laughs> Oh, that's good. Uh, I have one question here that is on, on um, relating back a little bit to how we um, how you set out uh, to get the the um, empirics here, and that that is the ethical questions. I mean, we moved around it a little bit here as well. I think so. So, what about ethics here? Is there anything we as researchers need to think about when approaching individuals? Because your your questions are quite sensitive, and and as you reveal here as well, that some some people are overestimating what they do here. Uh, to some extent as well when come at their importance of user knowledge for example so is, is there anything that we as researchers need to be aware and, and careful of while reaching out to individuals in this way yeah so most of the time um we didn't run into any problems but at the same time we were also aware that we are contacting people from outside and asking them not about the organization itself, but about feelings toward the organization. And most people were, were mm -hmm. fine with this. Um, but it happened one time that a, um, a CEO contacted us and she was not uh, she was not OK with us um, collecting data from 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 her employees, basically out, outside um, outside the, the boundaries of the organization via the social network. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, yeah, we had some back and forth and um, and figured out, uh, out a way to deal with this. But in, in general, at the same time, we were contacting the individuals from outside. So it, it's uh, we felt that it, it's okay if they put their profiles out and we, we, we sent them an email and approached mm -hmm. them that uh, they should uh, make this decision because we're also talking about their their feelings and identity uh, and uh, identities and these things. So in that sense, we didn't run into um, any ethical conflicts related to the to the data collection. Um, then, of course, it's always um, should you cold cold contact people. But uh, I think that's not only for our type of research methods, right? That's always um, an, yeah. an ethical issue. But that's um, that's a different 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 animal, so to say. I guess. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And it is interesting because these professional networks, they are so linked to the brand of the company and, and, the, and the identity of the company. But it's also the individuals that show what they have been doing, what they are focusing upon. So it is an area to treat with care, of course, as well. Um, so and, That's and amazing. We were lucky that we were, I, we had the feeling that we were asking them about stuff that they would like to talk about, right? So they were they were gamers or mountain bikers and we also asked them about the job and i think many of them actually self-selected into the organization because they they would like to work especially in this organization where they can um showcase the use knowledge and apply their use knowledge and then work in fields that they are that they are in also in their leisure time so that's the nice thing about um user studies in general that people often like to talk about the stuff that they're doing yeah, yeah. and we felt the same here in this case yeah always the case uh, often the case within innovation management as well because these individuals struggle sometimes within their own organization talking about identity <laughs> so yeah uh, we have a question here from alexander Zutko, uh that points the question to you that it is increasingly difficult to get in-depth access to companies due to strict NDAs, etc. Uh, consequently, it can be tough to expose tensions and conflicts that might be seen as negative. Uh, how do you think we should approach this problem as researchers? Do you have any useful advice? Thank you, Alexander, for that question. So help us out here, Tim and Christina. I think it's a really valid question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really... <laughs> It is a really uh, uh, important question, and, and mm -hmm. yeah, I guess all researchers uh, struggle with this. That um, I mean, in in a way, we circumvented this problem by using uh, the professional network uh, as our access point. Mm -hmm. um, in um, other cases, when we do work with uh, with companies, we try to um highlight the benefits um to all parties concerned um even if some kinds of tension are surfaced then maybe it's better to surface them than not to 
service them. Um, so um, yeah, we we try to highlight some some win win possibilities uh, from this research. But you know, sometimes um, yeah, it's true that companies just don't want to participate. I, um, I think that's that's true. I th I mean the other um, way is to use different kinds of data uh, but uh, for this um, whether it's i don't know uh, secondary data lab uh, experiments whatever but but for this kind of research that we wanted to do here yeah. i think this was the right approach mm. yeah I, I agree and to some extent it, it overrides then the discussion that many of us uh, have when we're out in the organization as, as soon as we talk about innovation generally it's, it's sensitive it could be sensitive from a nature point of view as well so we get information that we normally need to put an NDA on. Um, and this is to some extent a way to get behind that. Uh, but then of course we have to be extra careful in, in how we formulate ourselves and what kind of questions they are. Um, this is great. We, we have one more question from the chat here from Jeremy Klein. Uh, he wants to consider identity uh, and write the sociology talk about identity construction and how people maintain fractured and uh, multiple identities. There is also a concept of uh, authentic identity. Did your research get any sense of where people's uh, authentic identities lie? Or do you see the process of identity construction uh, that is spanning between an employee and user being in constant and dynamic flux? Thank you, Jeremy, for that question. Um, yeah, so uh, to maybe I start with this and you continue. Um, we didn't get a chance to observe this very much, but we maybe we, we talked about it in interviews and so on. But I would see a huge uh, potential for future research um, in a more longitudinal uh, um, uh, research design to study uh, these processes with uh, like identity construction. And then uh, people also don't want to be in a constant um, situation of identity conflict. I think that was also um, um, uh, the, what the question hinted at. And so then they tend to um, reinterpret uh, or, or, or also de-identify uh, to some extent um, to, to lessen this, um, this conflict. Um, and then um, I could see that um, um, the degree of identification would change over time given the, the, the tenure in the company or maybe some events in the user uh, sphere or, or whatever. So, so um, um, viewing this or, or maybe also um, the, the more the firm gets to align um, the, the work for the firm and the, um, um, the, the user experience for the employee, the, the more this gets sort of self-reinforcing and, and uh, re, re positive for the employee that would um, create uh, changes over time. So, so basically what I'm saying is I think there's a, a big um, need for longitudinal research and for for um, studying these processes, uh, which which we didn't do in this um, paper. I completely agree on that. That would be a very interesting study. And also as identity changes over time, as you're talking about here as well. And, and also I'm thinking that if we add the, the managerial level that we were talking about before, how their affair, awareness of this and awareness also of the potential conflicts that arise through dual identification at the individual level would be very interesting to keep in mind during such a process. Um, and of course, how that affects the way of working, processes, routine, et cetera. It would be an, very interesting to, uh, well, we maybe we'll see that. It takes a few years though with the longitudinal studies. So <laughs> we maybe have to wait for that a bit, I assume. <laughs> yeah, but a very interesting one. Um, could you have done this without saying going back to to the empirical setting here? Do, do you think you could have reached this without the approach you used? Um, I, I think it was um, quite helpful to use uh, the platform, this real platform, because uh, we had um, now we had this uh, type of recruiter access where we could um, search people, we could uh, search firms, we could identify people, we knew uh, we could also get additional information from the profiles, do some additional checks. 
Um, so I, I, I would assume that you just need this type of special access to uh, the social the social network. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, you will have to circumvent some some barriers that you will be hitting. Right, you cannot just um, just contact anyone. Um, I don't know what the rules are what uh, today, but usually you have to get some kind of premium access to 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 contact people. So um, in that sense, it what was quite helpful to do it with the with the talent tool or recruiter tool or um, the, the special tool that we used on 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 uh, on Xing. I think it's um, but before you do this, probably it, it makes sense to kind of screen the social network. How many firms are there in the in the industry that you want to sample, and are these firms that are on the on the platform also the the firms that you would expect to see? And these things, I think you can can scout uh, before whether it's uh, it's possible. To use network, uh, and then if you if you implement it, I think these some kind of um, special access makes uh, one's life uh, a lot lot easier operationally. I completely agree, and it also relates to two things that we have been over here before that that you are you you are well embedded in the field of research here. That to just go out do this without knowing the empirical reality and context of which those individuals you're interested in would probably be quite tough. Uh, so from my perspective, your experience before helped you here, of course, as well, so that you know this area. But then also to, uh, to oh, sorry, you got and, and then you also, <laughs> if, if you, um, by using these um, these setups, these accounts, you also mm -hmm. have to buy in from the platform, right? So they they, they got mm -hmm. the thing officially, so then it's also okay to, to use the platform for data collection. At least this is what, what we felt and also, it was fine for the platform so we never um we all unfortunately we also never talked to them about using this for research right did Bettina did you talk to to someone at that thing about this so uh, maybe that's um that's that's an open business field for them but um yeah <laughs> yeah and and that's of course we always go into the inverted u shape when we talk about people and uh, and what we do and if we increase stuff we do uh, there will be a maximum whether there is too many researchers harvesting data in this platform for them to continue functioning in the way that we would like them to uh, but for specific questions or for specific topics of course interesting but i was also thinking about one more thing that both of you have been over a bit here that is what is really a user here and going back to how you extracted the data from and how you identify these persons gave you the opportunity to actually go beyond looking at who do the manager think has this ability or just a self-assessment if I have this um, uh, competence or, or uh, profile that you actually went with that from the, um, from the information they already had provided them, themselves that how who is really a user here uh, an internal embedded user in that sense which I think is an, an interesting and important part to, to look at as well here as well, and to bring up, of course. Yeah, so if if uh, other studies um, specifically wanted to establish, for instance, who is an embedded lead user, so uh, um, um, uh, not just embedded in the company and a user, but a particularly lead user, then, then I could see that it's, um, uh, this requires a little bit of more thinking because um, if you ask the employees, they might want to brag about how close they are to the customer, or maybe um, the managers would have a different perspective on the um, yeah the extent to which this particular employee is ahead of a trend, really, uh, or maybe it's just a, a very um, opaque niche of the market that he's ahead of. Um, so, um, um, so there, um, it's. I think it's 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 good to be aware of um, information asymmetries between the manager and the employee, but also maybe be, be aware of, um, yeah, self-serving uh, or, or social desirability in terms of answering behavior, and and to think about how this would. Um, or how this could affect the the piece of research that, that what is trying to do. That also relates to what we discussed about before, which is actually my final question when it comes to the the both both when we discussed the uh, managerial. Uh, uh, implications of your results and also a venue for future results and it is this very very interesting area that how managers can be aware of this and also maybe even the user my, they might not be that aware of this always that it is that it could actually create tensions for them that are hard 
to uh, to handle uh, that would be a very nice study to dig deeper into the awareness of this as well and how how to align that with an organization's other goals and activities yeah i think it's it's a it's a fascinating um, area for future study if you think about it firms may have these open innovation strategies reaching out to external stakeholders to uh, absorb knowledge and and uh, uh, whatnot but uh, here we're looking at the if you like the micro processes underlying this uh, and um, um, so it may be that uh, for the individual employee this task of reaching out comes with um, certain challenges or maybe also some some opportunities that um, yeah may affect uh, how how this um, will pan out for uh, for the company so um, uh, I think that's that's an interesting perspective because as you were um, saying at the beginning in the end it's about individual people who need to do this uh, and and they may find it uh, uh, very satisfying or or they may find it challenging for various reasons and um, um, I think that's an that's a an area that could do with a lot more uh, research and I think that would be very interesting yeah we hope we'll see something in the pipeline in the future from you in this direction as well <laughs> as a subject that area. Is there anything else you want to send with the audience here when it comes to what they should keep in mind doing this kind of research and then accessing this kind of data or any, any recommendations? Well, maybe if I just um, get this, uh, take this opportunity to to point out this this area of embedded users or embedded lead users, I think this is a, I think a big phenomenon, as I was saying, and it's just a uh, an emerging area for research, and it's very uh, near and dear to our hearts. Uh, uh, certainly, Tim and I have done uh, some work on this, but I think there's a lot more to do. And um, as I said, I mean there is this very entrenched thinking that users are out there and the firm is in here. Uh, but but you know, seeing that there is a lot more to this, um, um, and that there are users also inside the firm, but then they have trouble spanning this boundary in some ways, and so on. I think there's a lot of uh, richness there that that really um, hasn't been understood so well. And um, I mean, honestly, Tim's and my work also highlighted the the, the benefits of this quite a bit um, in terms of. Uh, um, the, you know, innovativeness and uh, boundary spanning and, and so on. Um, but um, this paper that we're talking about here is, is actually the, the first one, I think, that says, okay, there are, there are also some challenges uh, in terms of um, tension between the dual um, uh, sources of identification and the different demands and then job satisfaction and so on. So, so in a way, maybe, you know, our picture was overly rosy that we painted so, uh, so also there's there's room for for looking at the, the challenges that come with being in this position of um, uh, having this dual allegiance um, so so overall I think it would be awesome to to see more uh, research on this um, position of embedded users embedded lead users I completely agree thank you very much Christina Tim, do you want to add some final? Um, no, I, I fully no. agree to, to, yeah, to what yeah. Christina said. We yeah. would like to see more on innovative users in firms, also on the dark side. Yeah, we also think it's a, it's a broad phenomenon, right? We, we see it in, in process users. Christina did some research on, on for forensic services. So yeah. users within the firm who use, um, use processes, we also see it in the different business units, right? You have one, one business unit that is a user unit. You have a business unit with the manufacturing units. So it's also these internal uh, lead user units out there. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big field um, and it's a, an interesting field to, to investigate. And I think it's a, actually open. So I think there, there's space for more people there. So that would be great if people would join us. And you also Absolutely. did. You also did work there, right? So on on yeah, yeah. doctors in yeah, yeah. in uh, in firms, um, which also has interesting implications because mm -hmm. they have to have to stop using the products. Would be also a nice research question: how this pans out longitudinally. So yeah, I think there's lots of lots of interesting Definitely. research questions out there. 
that's an industry where they actually get embedded quite quickly uh, in that regard <laughs> uh, and not in the good way always as well yeah that's a great point thank you so much thank you so much Tim and Christina Thank you.